Hello, everyone. Um, this is quite cool, actually. I feel like I'm back at university. This is awesome. Um, so I, I, I did a, um, this, this presentation. I was actually sort of roped into doing it for one of the, the Lynx regional meetings in, in Manchester. And um, sort of uh, I had to come up with something relatively quickly. Uh, but the, uh, the project uh, that I've been working on is, is to replace a lot of Bikemark's core infrastructure, um, which, of course, Cisco 7600s, as you might guess. And actually... After I did it, I got quite a lot of really good feedback. There were a lot of people that came up and they were asking me for more information and, and um, you know, not necessarily just people with 7600s, but they, they wanted to talk to me about um, the, the, the platforms that we've, we've gone into buying um, and how we did it and all sorts of other things like that. So I was, I was um, you know, uh, I was quite happy to come and do this for UK NOF as well. And uh, I, I hope it's not too boring um, as it is. So. Um, tiny bit about Bike Mark. Obviously, Keith just mentioned that we've been doing um, some, some sponsored hosting for UK NOF in the past. Uh, we are a hosting company, obviously, based in York, which is a bit different, but it's cool. Um, we built our own data centre in York, which is actually quite a nice little place. And uh, yes, it doesn't get flooded, before you ask. And uh, it, it, you know, it is actually quite cool. It, the stars aligned, and we've, we've ended up with quite a nice facility, and everyone's really tired of me saying this. So um, We still have some space in Manchester, which is where I'm based. Um, and we're growing and hoping in, to improve on all of that in due course. Um, if you came up on the East Coast Main Line, you would have seen the, possibly seen this sign just north of York. Um, that's the data centre there. Um, that's the network, as it looks, uh, from the website. Um, there's uh, obviously a couple of lines missing, but um, that's because we've just added some more capacity. Um, and that's how it looks like from space, sort of. <laughs> I, I think. Um, there, there's a little bit of artistic licence going on in there, but these are all on our website if you ever want to you know, study them in detail. Um, why do we have all of this? I mean, the important thing is why do we have, um, you know, quite a big sort of mpl uh, core network that runs around the country? Obviously, the data centres are important, the peering is important, uh, and we do have quite a bit of UK peering. Uh, we're four IXPs uh, in three different cities in around the UK. Um, we're small but well-built, I think. Um, you know, we're not the biggest network. We're definitely not as uh, the sort of scale that uh, Richard was just talking about in terms of Facebook, but um, we, we, we've managed to, to invest well, and we have very few outages as a result of this. Um, we're doing everything as much as we can with your stack, and I obviously talked previously about IPv6, IPv6 only, which we have done uh, some of. Um, we try not to make any single points of failure. It really does actually make for hassle-free maintenance, and, and sometimes that might look like over-engineering, but actually, when you're there at 3 o'clock in the morning, this is really quite helpful. So, you know, good investment in the network, and that's been wonderful. It's generally over-provisioned. We, we have a ton more capacity than we actually need, which is quite helpful with DDoSs. Uh, and we make use of plenty of EMPLS tunnels because, of course, having your own data centre, you end up with people wanting back all to various other places around the country. So actually, that's been incredibly useful. Uh, and uh, to do all of this, and, and certainly for many years in the past, we've wound up with a lot of 7600s to do it with. Um, plenty of other devices in the network. As, you know, we, we tend to try and silo things out to give them and, and, and concentrate on the role that they're good at. Um, one of the things that I wanted to just... <laughs> as a sort of test and a little, uh, just an exercise, is just to actually sort of say, look around you and just see how many people are smirking at this point, just because, you know, they know that they're going to get told about their 7600s. Um, but yeah, there, there was a very good reason for using these equipment, you know, pieces of equipment. They, they were really quite featureful uh, devices. Um, they switched and route at predictable speeds. You could upgrade them, you could start small, go bigger swap out the supervisors, the line cards as you needed. Um, if you were into sort of big carrier stuff, I mean, there was ATM and STH op options and the various other things I've probably forgotten. Um, and even now, actually, you still have software releases that are coming out for the 720. Um, the 15.5, iOS 15.5 is, is being released. Of course, the, the 6500 was long since discontinued in that respect. So um, even now, you can actually still buy uh, 7600s if you really want them uh, with RSP 720 until I think October. So you've got a little bit of time if you, uh, if you want to go out and get some. Um, you've still got loads of community support because there's, there's absolutely tons of people still using these. Um, and things like CNSP have been, uh, I, I mean, I've, I've had so much help from people on there. That's actually helped massively because it's kind of avoids you having to go and talk to tech. It's quite useful, just using the same thing everyone else has. And of course, these things also have built in firewalling if you would like to go out and buy the firewall services module. Um, which, if you ever did, you probably would want to burn something down. Uh, thankfully, we don't have any of those. But it's not aging well, um, and this is really the crux of the whole problem. Uh, we've Obviously, there's the, the very well-known FIB limit, and we had the uh, 512k day a little while ago, where the DF said, BGP DF said, reached 512k prefixes, and uh, some people's networks fell to pieces and uh, were hurriedly recarved as the routers were booted back up. Um, 
of course, the SUP 720 and the RSP 720 don't do any dynamic recarving between IPv4 and IPv6 as well. So you might have a, a maximum pool, but it won't actually allocate those uh, without you rebooting the box. The bigger problem that we have at the moment is the 1 gig RAM limit in the SUP 720. Um, it's pretty much game over if you're still running full transit peering, uh, sorry, full transit feeds into these devices. They just don't have enough RAM to do it anymore. Um, certainly not. I mean, 12.2 releases use a bit less RAM, but they were, you know, they, there's so many features missing from those now versus some of the newer 15.3 uh, iOS releases and things like that. So it's, it's getting quite difficult. The RSP 720 has a fair bit more RAM, um, but we are still coming up on those horrible FID limits. So uh, more importantly, limitations on IPv6, and this was really important for us. I mean, if they ever even see an MLD packet, they fall to pieces, literally. Um, URPF doesn't work for IPv6. NetFlow doesn't work for IPv6. Um, you've got no multi-point L2 VPN, so you can't really do any uh, VPLS or anything like that unless you go out and buy those ridiculously expensive WAN cards that, um, if you say that quickly, it sounds bad, uh, WAN cards that they uh, <laughs> used to sell. Um, the uh, back, uh, back plane capacity, yeah, terrible. And, and you know, the, the, the SUP 2T upgrade is, is actually quite good. I mean, the, it's, a, it's a half decent sort of supervisor, but we're only talking 80 gig back plane, um, which is still pretty poor in today's world. And um, yeah, we took one of these out of Reynolds House recently and we saw the power usage drop by two kilowatts. Um, so, you know, watts per gigabit in terms of how much I can actually squeeze out of them is just not good enough. Uh, and yeah, very, very slow. Uh, every single thing that you ever want to do with it. In fact, actually, the other night I was upgrading a, another router down in London, just rebooted it, and that involved obviously shutting down some BGP sessions, full transit feeds and things like that, gracefully. Both of the, uh, both of the remaining 7600s that we have, the two that are left, refused to answer any SMP queries during that period because they just couldn't cope with dealing with the updates and anything else. Um, so, you know, it's just it's a frustration that I'm, I'm really happy to get rid of. But it's been a bit like Trigger's Broom, and, and everyone's got very used to this. And if you don't know what Trigger's Broom is, it's effectively uh, the broom that he's had for 20 years, and he's got a little service medal there for having it. And it's had uh, 17 new heads and 14 new handles. So, of course, it's not the same broom that he had in the first place. And that's, that's how the 7600 has been for everyone. But they, they have actually pushed out proper end-of-sale notifications now. Um, and if, if I'm honest, um, you know, the, or, to be fair, actually, Cisco agreed with me. They've just got a list of a ASR 9000 parts there just to say, buy these instead, which is relatively sensible. Um, actually, there was, there was a bit of a... This, this is actually quite a long-running project. This has been going on since quite 2012, and I started the company about 2013. We, we, had a, we had the typical problem of the SUP 720 sort of melting at a peering exchange. as a bit of broadcast that started floating around, and it just fell to pieces. Uh, we bought an RSP 720, so we thought that might help. Um, and for some reason, that's actually probably serendipitous at this point, uh, it managed to just do a bunch of software routing and everything fell to pieces even further. Uh, and then we discovered that actually that, that supervisor then changes the support costs from per chassis to per line card. So actually it made a massive difference to the amount of money we'd have to actually pay to support the thing. Um, so we flung that back somewhere in the direction of the vendor. Um, the SUP720 went back in, some remedial patches were made, um, and shortly afterwards we bought our first ASR9000, which was a bit of an impulse buy, but at the time it was just sort of becoming to notoriety as quite a good uh, edge, edge peering router with a solid CPU. And actually for, at the time, I think it was Lynx Juniper, Lynx Extreme, and, and Lonap, um, with two different IPs on Lonap as well. So, you know, it was, it was actually having quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of connections. Um, and we discovered that that was doing really well. It ate some BGP sessions for breakfast and didn't even flap once. I mean, there was, there was absolutely no drama at all, and we could get on and, and start thinking about what we could do with the rest of the core network. Our likely options, I mean, this is what most people end up thinking about, actually, when they start thinking about replacing their 7600s, is the, the SUP2T or, or, more recently, the SUP6T. Um, practically, it's... It's not much different. It's, it's pretty much the same architecture. There's some incremental upgrades there. The sub 2 t gave you sort of 80, 80 gig per line slot. The, the, the sub 6 t claims, I think, 220 per supervisor per line card, per, per slot, sorry. Um, but at the moment, all the line cards that are out for it are just 160 gig or so a slot. Um, they really wouldn't gain us any real saving over buying a completely different vendor at all because we didn't have any S chassis. For, uh, 
S chassis for the 7600, so they wouldn't have taken a sub-2T anyway. All the power supplies would have had to be changed. Uh, the line cards, we had one of the, uh, the nice 6908 line cards, but it came with a DFC on it for the RSP720, so that would have had to have been replaced. It wasn't supported with it. So it was a complete pain for us. And the other problem that I've noticed as well is that it, there seems to be some uncertainty on the 2 million IPv4 FIB scale, um, which is equally known as the XXL PFC4. Um, I'm not, I haven't yet seen anything concrete on whether or not they're actually going to come out for the sub-2T or sub-6T. They did obviously come out with the 6880XL, if anyone has seen that, but uh, not entirely certain where that is, and it seems like the, the, the business unit focus has shifted a bit within Cisco. The ASO 9000, we, we bought one, obviously, and it was working well. It seems to be popular with other people. Um, certainly, there's a, a growing community, actually, of people that are using that, and that's, that's really fantastic. Um, Juniper MX, we did actually look into these as well. The MPC3E, NG, that's quite a mouthful, uh, is actually fantastic on paper. It looks really, really great. Um, they had an uh, unfortunate problem in that they could barely tell us how many uh, IPv4 routes it would hold, and it seemed to be some sort of pulling teeth exercise to find this out. Um, but it also seems very popular with others. Uh, we also looked at Arista. They had... Um, They've obviously, since we've actually started this, and actually since I last gave a talk about this, they launched their R series, which is really quite interesting. It's based on the Jericho Broadcom chipset. Um, it's not entirely ready for us, but we've actually been looking into it, and we've got some potential uses for it in the future. So uh, actually, uh, as, as you move further and forward, you know, certainly look into it. Um, I think they've got something very special there. So. The decider in the end was the Cisco pricing on the ASR 9K was very amicable. Actually, we, we had a really, we found eventually a very, very good account manager and was able to work with Cisco properly for us. Um, refurb pricing for some of the older kit that we picked up, um, that actually worked out really well as well. Unfortunately, sometimes you can't get what you want and the pricing is some, sometimes horrifically variable. Um, so that's not really as useful, um, but uh, getting a good account manager and getting a good uh, dialogue open with Cisco was, was really the key to the whole thing. Um, the hardware support costs for the Juniper routers were about 70% every year of what they wanted us to pay for the hardware in the first place. Um, so I kind of went, no, thank you. But they, uh, they did look good. So if that's, if that's your thing, go for it. We did also have some concerns over the MX-104 control plane because the 9001 actually fits into a lot of places for us. It's a very good low power, um, power usage. It's under 400 watts or so. But the MX4104 control plane, we've heard some pretty terrible stories about how slow it is, and it's, uh, it's, not, um, it's not been well recommended. So you know, we, we tended to skip away from Juniper a little bit because we would have been stuck with 240s or above. And obviously the ASR9000 have proven that it's interrupted quite well with the 7600s. So we, we resolved effectively to, to start buying as many of those as we could and rip out the 7600s and sort of burn them somewhere. And this is where it gets complicated. I mean, this is kind of part two of the whole thing, um, why we did it, how we sort of came to this problem. Everything was burning, and, and we needed some new routers. This is a bit of a crib sheet based on um, iOS XR and uh, the actual Cisco ASR9000 uh, product line. Um, I'll skip over this, because I think I'm running out of time uh, a little bit. But uh, effectively, uh, iOS XR, Definitely nothing like iOS. It's got a lovely commit system. Root policy is much, much nicer than root maps and prefix sets over prefix lists and various other stuff like that. Don't underestimate how long it takes to convert because it does take a while, but it is really worthwhile, so do definitely do it. Um, there's a bigger emphasis on control plane policing uh, instead of sort of things like just basic access lists on line, line VTIs and things like that. Um, definitely look into that. There's a really good guide called Securing or Hardening iOS XR Devices, which is um, absolutely fantastic, so look into that. Um, they do license L3 VPN use, a bit like Juniper do, I think, as well, possibly, or maybe not, not sure. But definitely, if you want to run any VRFs, you have to buy a separate license for it. And the software itself costs. There's a right to use per chassis as well. So you have $15,000 list price right to use for each chassis. Um, it's QNX-based, and it's moving to a linux base later, but they're going to keep both of them running at the same time. Um, the, the, the big drawback there is that the, uh, the linux base only works on the absolute latest um, generation equipment, which is a bit of a pain, but we're going um, uh, we, to, we'll be okay for, I think, for a few years at least, certainly. Um, chassis lessons, there's two sets, and some of them are actually disappearing quite quickly. Um, the 9000 ones top out about 880 gig a slot. You've got the 9010 and the 9006. Um, the 9900 
uh, scale a lot further, 1.6 terabits or so per slot. Um, and it's dependent on which SFCs you actually put in the back. They take the uh, switch fabric away from the supervisor and pull that out, a bit like the CRSs and things like that, uh, in a sort of a smaller smaller fashion. The 9006 chassis and the 9904 run with side-to-back airflow, but there are baffle kits available with that, and do buy them, especially if you're getting a 9006, because I heard from someone yesterday it took them two days to rack a 9006 with that baffle kit. Uh, just 40, you know, you can't hold it up and screw in 40 screws at the same time, it's just a pain in the bum. So, um, PEMS come with it. There's also V2 versions of fan trays, V2 version of, of the power entry modules, PEMS. Um, these are all things that you should definitely look into. Don't take the older stuff um, because you'll just you'll, you'll, you'll regret it later, basically. Um, all the supervisors have excellent control plane performance, um, and I'm completely ignoring the first generation stuff because it doesn't. Uh, it's not much of an upgrade from the 7600s. Scale comes in two options, mostly about uh, queuing, a uh, few other little things. Um, it's not in any way about FIB scale, which is good, so it means you get the same FIB scale if you buy TR or SE. We've bought everything TR. It's fine for our, for our usage. Um, there's a couple of, effectively there's two different, uh, two different types of supervisors you can buy. There's the Tomahawk versions and there's the Typhoon versions. Um, the Tomahawk ones are obviously a little bit newer. What's interesting though is that um, you have three different types of supervisors based on how, uh, how the, they interact with the SFCs and the scale that you get in the chassis. So it's worth looking in, making sure that you're actually looking at the right supervisor, the right generation of supervisor, and however many SFCs you actually need for these things. Um, what's interesting, though, is that they've just released, and they had before, uh, an RSP440 LT, which was a li limited version to 160 gig, and you could license upgrade that. And I say 160 gig, that's per slot. The new one that's just come out is the RSP880 rate limited, which is exactly the same price as an RSP440. So you get the newer generation for the same amount of money, the same performance, and if you want to later down the road, you can upgrade, and it doesn't cost you anything extra versus what you would have paid for it originally. So actually, that was a really sensible buy, and we've bought a couple of those. Um, so yeah, uh, Typhoon line cars, it's pretty much what most people are running at the moment, I think. And most people certainly in our sort of guys with smaller networks. Um, about 45 million packets per second per MPU, but of course, remember that these are MPUs, they're not ASIC, uh, they're not exclusively ASIC driven. Um, so you will find that certain features and the, the amount of things that you actually ask the MPU to do will reduce your overall forwarding performance through them. And it's a very important thing to remember with these newer routers. Uh, again, scale comes in TRSE guys. Uh, mod cards are quite useful. They hold up to two MPAs. They're very, very good for, for mixing and matching 100 gig, 40 gig, um, 10 gig or, or 1 gig even. Um, no 100 gig options in those. There's very limited 100 gig options in the Typhoon stuff. They were sort of based on just one and two times 100 gig CFP designs. And, Honestly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put any money into them. They don't seem sensible. Um, the late edition has been the 56 gig cards, which are actually quite nice. If you just want a few 1 gig ports and a few 10 gig ports sat in there, they're actually quite a cheap option. They're fixed. They're not modular like the Mod 80, but they come in at slightly less money, so they're definitely worth looking into. Uh, we have actually bought a few of those as well. Um, Tomahawk stuff, I'm going to skip over this because I can't afford any of it. Um, the one thing I would remember is if you, if you have a quick look at the... Uh, 12 times 100 gig card, look at it in quite a lot of detail because it looks cheap and it looks quite interesting because it uses QSFP28, but it has incredibly small buffers and it doesn't have any fib scale at all. It's purely a P-facing card, I think. So um, that was a, a bit of a gotcha if anyone's there. Uh, but you definitely get better 100 gig density into these Tomahawk line cards because the MPU design is about three times faster than it was in the last generation. So you get quite a lot of throughput per uh, MPA, MPU. So. Um, in the 9001, we've actually bought quite a few of these. We've got three of these. Um, it's effectively a, a Typhoon-based Mod 80 SE with something like an RS440 uh, so supervisor welded to it internally. Um, and they actually use some of the spare capacity for the MPUs for the onboard uh, 10 gig ports that are in there. Uh, so it makes it a little bit more oversubscribed than a Mod 80 in a, in a chassis-based system. But the, the huge benefit that you get from that router is that it works in under, well under 400 watts. And I've been out there and I've tested this and I'm you know, pulling, out, pulling out a sort of 7604 or something with a few line cards in it and putting in one of these lowers your power bills in Equinix by quite a substantial amount, which is quite useful. Um, one of the other things that was quite interesting was that there was always a 9001S, which is again a rate limited version of this and you can pay a license to upgrade it, but it's a really nice little entry model um, for someone that just needs a very small amount of bandwidth but a very fast CPU to do some peering. This was uh, effectively don't buy Trident. Um, but, uh, the important thing here was 
<laughs> don't buy any of the first generation AS09K stuff. It's now been made end, end of sale. Um, the support costs are ludicrously high compared to the Typhoon stuff. The power usage is higher than the Typhoon stuff. And actually, once you've actually done some, some good sums, it just doesn't make sense to buy any of it anymore. So don't buy it. There are some RSPs, uh, RSP4G and RSP8G, I think, and they are as slow as the 7600s are anyway. So we won't do that. However, you're going to sit there and think, how much is all this going to cost, and why won't you let me buy the cheap stuff? It's pretty much the same reason as why I'm suggesting you should or, you know, rip out your 7600s and replace them as soon as possible. It is expensive, but you do need to work with, uh, with, with your vendors. Some procurement tips in that sense. Put a spreadsheet together, work out some builds. Um, Cisco, uh, there's a really wonderful website called Cis Cis ciscoprice.com, and it's just the GPL uploaded on a searchable database. And you can get some reseller vendors done this somewhere, and it's an absolutely fantastic resource. Um, you can find all of the part codes, work out what the actual build is, um, and then you can start looking at roughly what discount level you can expect and how hard you're going to have to work to get down to the price that you're going to want. So most resellers give 40 to 45% discount easily, depending on their partner status, um, and you need to go for Cisco pricing support where they involve Cisco to get any more than that, um, and you need some good reasons for it as well. Uh, but pick a good reseller, because if you take a build to them, they will lock, Cisco will lock it to that reseller for about three months. So if they're a rubbish reseller in the first place and they're no good to work with, you, need a, you won't be able to move it on and you won't get the same pricing support. So it's really important to start with the right people. Bundles available. There are some fantastic bundles out there that, that, that have, they kind of come and go and they're on little sort of things. And uh, if you can find a bundle, it will make a massive difference to your end price as well. So always try and get some of those. And trade in some 7600s. Uh, we, we did actually end up trading in all of our kit because the amount of money that it was going to discount off the final amount was way better than we could have got by selling it on eBay. I mean, beyond belief. Um, I am quite upset that I'm not going to get a chance to hit any of this stuff with a sledgehammer, but um, generally like, it was always worthwhile to, to trade it in and just get rid of it and get shot of it. Um, I don't want to be tempted to sit there and think I can put one of these devices into a pop summer or put it in for a temporary usage and just think, oh, it'll be okay and come and get the power bill later and find out that it wasn't a good idea. Um, don't rule out refurbished kits, as I said before. You might be able to get what you need, but it is a little bit spotty at times. But you can usually always get it supported, and that's not too bad. We've got some, some few bits and pieces of refurbished kit, chassis and whatnot, and they've all been fine. So um, We've implemented a mixture of 9001, as I said, and, uh, and 9006 chassis. So we've got a few more chassis coming tomorrow. Um, it's all about power limits in pops. So, I mean, in, in York, we've obviously got our own power. We can afford to, you know, put in a, a decent chassis-based system. They run about 1.4 kilowatts. It should drop a little bit once we take some of the Trident cards out because we bought some when we shouldn't have done. Um, Front-to-back cooling is a must of the 9006s, but also it helps to, to, to put the baffle kit in to make sure that they are easily mountable as well. Um, they're just heavy, horrible things otherwise. Uh, we've um, pretty much got all of our peering in transit now run on the ASR9K, which actually gives me a lot less headaches than, it, uh, you know, than, than you could possibly imagine. I don't have to worry about routers falling apart every time I try and turn up a peer group. It really is lightning fast. It makes a big difference to just you know, any, any form of maintenance that you have to perform. Um, so, yeah, we're hoping that this is all going to be uh, you know, done and dusted by October, which will probably be sort of a, almost a three-and-a-half-year project. But, you know, if you drip-feed it in um, and make sure you get it done, it's, uh, it's not been too bad. Um, we're actually looking at um, running uh, iOS XR 6.1X later this year because it has some nice fixes in it, which I'll go over very quickly in a minute. Um, but we have uh, already got one 9001 running on 6.0.2, which is actually running really quite well, and it's literally the newest release. And, it's just stable, so that's pretty. That's been wonderful. Um, gotchas and bugs and things like that. That you know, every new hardware comes with some of them. Um, the 9006 baffle claims to be 3U in total. It's 3.3U. No idea why. Um, that was a bit of a pain in the ass. The uh, three kilowatt PS PSUs come with C22 sockets instead of C20. We have literally nothing else in the entire data center that uses these sockets, so we had to go and have some cables made up for it. No idea why. Um, kernel dumps on the 9001, if you put a little e-USB stick in, it'll actually write the kernel dump out to that, but if you don't have anything like that in there, it won't do it. Uh, there's not enough space, on, I think, on the medium it tries to write it to, so it just fails quietly. Um, onboard RSP ports, these are annoying because we have to have one gig in every single place to export local NetFlow. You can't use the onboard RSP ports for NetFlow export um, or forwarding in general. They're just not on the regular forwarding path, so definitely not like a 7600 in that respect. 
Uh, Typhoon cards still need workarounds to get BGP ASNs written into IPv6 NetFlow exports. Now, this is down to Cisco's determination that they must use link local addresses uh, on the interfaces for forwarding and, and, and written into the FIB. Uh, sorry, the Ceph table. So you, unfortunately, when it tries to export um, an ASN into an IPv6 packet, if it sees FE80 colon colon, it just writes zero and sends it off which has never been useful. There is a little workaround where you can actually set the next top explicitly to the GUA address, and it will then actually work properly. Um, so I can actually see my Sky IPv6 traffic, which is very nice. But um, there is a, a, a general knob to change that behavior in 6.1.1, I'm told by TAC, which I'm looking forward to, and that's why I'd like to run it. Um, MTUs are counted differently between 7600s and uh, S and 9Ks. It's one of the wonderful things when you first turn up a link between the two of them. You're like, why isn't OSPF converging? Why isn't ISS working or whatever else? Um, you have to sort of uh, take away the Ethernet header uh, from your calculations um, on the 7600 side. The AS9000 doesn't implicitly add one. Um, so you need to tell it that your MTU includes this and, and make them match. And it, it is very, it, once you get used to it, it's absolutely fine. It gets a bit more complicated if you're doing any L2 VPN stuff, but um, it, it's easily you know, remedied. Um, you just end up adding 14, 18, or uh, 22 bytes as, as, as you need to. Um, don't delete the built-in admin account, because I did, and I thought, I don't need this. Um, it's like Unix root, but the best thing it does is, is when you actually log onto the console again, it goes, you don't have an admin account, so I'm going to make you create one. And I thought, hang on a minute, this is literally the worst thing that could possibly be imagined. You've just let someone with a console cable hack my router. Um, so don't ever delete it. I would, I would advocate um, changing it to something else and just leaving it without any permissions and giving you permissions to your regular users. Um, the upgrades are a pain, um, but... Apparently, they're going to get better in the Linux space, but unfortunately, it's Tomahawk only. Mm, yeah, you know, they're actually manageable. The individual upgrade guides are very, very good. Despite all of this, they do work. And there's a wonderful little picture there of what happened um, a while ago. I meant to put this in the original presentation. I didn't. A while ago, when um, Lonap had a broadcast storm. And there's a little jump there in the processor usage. Um, but the 7600 would have completely been useless at this point. The 9001 just kept on and was very, very happy. So that, for me, was... I'm a happier bunny. I'm much, much happier about this. Um, you can read this then later if you want. Um, there's a lot of features in there. Upgrading isn't just about port speeds. It's definitely about features, and it's definitely about having a, a nicer time and a much more stable network. Um, and there's a few little links on there, things that I think, if, you, if you're actually interested in this hardware, you should definitely read it uh, thoroughly. So um, thank you very much. Any questions? And I'm very sorry for overrunning. OK, thank you, Tom. <laughs> Any questions? Got one up there. I hasten to add that there was plenty that I had to skip over there. So, um, actually, I, I enjoyed this, Tom. So, oh, so you. I'm more on the training side, clearly. Um, so, Marwan Fade from Sterling University and from Hubs. Just a quick one. Given that you've got two of these machines left, I realize they're extraordinarily expensive to, to, to power, but. Have you thought about maybe writing them off for the value of the trade-in and then donating those two boxes to a community network or the university, perhaps? So when I, when I first did this presentation, I did it at Manchester, and the first question was, can I have your 7600s <laughs> if you don't want them? And I said, no, I don't want you to run them. They, these things are a hazard to your network stability. Um, if I'm honest, we could have done that um, for lack of... You know, we do a lot of sponsorship and we do a lot of sort of um, nice things for the, for the communities. And if we'd known that someone wanted them in a research sense, then we probably could have given them away. But actually, it worked out a lot better for us to trade them into Cisco. So they make that possible. Sorry about that. No. <laughs> if anyone else wants to come and bug me later, then feel free. I, I, I'm absolutely fine with that. Okay. Okay, thank you, Tom. Thank you.